Good evening and welcome to the South Downs Planetarium in Chichester. During the long periods of lockdown, many people have found that taking up an interest in nature or the natural world in general has helped them to cope with anxiety and stress. Indeed, many studies have demonstrated the positive effects of the natural world on our mental health at this time. This has led many people to take up an interest in the night sky. But during lockdown, when we all have to stay home, it's not possible to travel out to a really clear, dark site to get a good view of the stars. So we decided that we would bring the night sky to you, right into your homes, using our magnificent star projector here to take you on a tour of the winter night sky. Many of the objects I shall be describing you can see for yourselves by looking out of a window, but remember to turn off all the lights in the room first, or from your front or back garden, wherever you can get the best view. Because we should be projecting the stars and other objects in the night sky on the inside of this huge hemispherical dome, we'll have to split our tour into two halves. First, we shall have a look at the northern sky and then we shall turn our attention to the south. So I'll just walk over to the control console of our star projector and we can get started. We begin our journey looking north. It's seven o'clock in the evening and this is the view you might see on a clear cloudless winter's night from the middle of a small town or perhaps an urban fringe area. From such places there's always a certain amount of light pollution, particularly sky glow, which is the yellowish glow you get in the sky caused by artificial light that goes up into the sky and is then scattered by particles in the atmosphere. This reduces the number of stars you can see, but it's still possible to make out the brighter stars and the most important of the star patterns, even from urban areas. If, however, you live in the countryside or a more rural area, you may be lucky enough to have really clear, dark skies. So let's see the difference it makes between the sky that you can see from a small town to the sky you can see from the countryside. As you can see, it makes quite a difference. On a really clear, dark night when there's no moon, a keen-sighted person might see over 2,000 stars in the sky. Many of the fainter stars that couldn't be seen before because they were lost in the glow of the lights are now clearly visible. It's now possible, seeing those fainter stars, to be able to make out all of the principal star patterns, or constellations, as we call them. A constellation is a group of stars that makes a shape in the sky. Long ago, people imagined that the sky was like a giant join-the-dot puzzle. They joined up the stars with imaginary lines and made shapes among the stars. These shapes reminded them of animals, birds, fish, heroes and heroines from their myths and legends. They named these patterns after what they thought they looked like. But it's fair to say you need a very vivid imagination to make out many of the fainter star patterns. Now for beginners, finding your way round the night sky may seem a daunting prospect at first. But it's a bit like when you go and visit a new city. You don't know where things are in the city to start with, but you quite quickly pick out a few landmarks and eventually you can find your way around. We do exactly the same in the night sky. There are certain star patterns or constellations which are very obvious and easy to find. We use these as landmarks to help us find the other constellations which are harder to locate. Looking north at this time of year, the star pattern which we're going to begin with is one that nearly everybody knows. We call it the plough, the North Americans call it the Big Dipper. It's basically shaped like a saucepan 
and at this time of year, in the early evening, the plough is coming up in the northeastern sky. I'm circling the pattern of the plough here. You can see there are seven main stars in that saucepan shape. Here's the bowl and there's the handle. Now these stars are actually part of a constellation called the Great Bear. The plough itself is not a constellation, it's part of one. So technically the plough is what we call an asterism, a group of stars that makes an obvious shape but isn't a constellation on its own. Incidentally, all those seven stars in the plough have names. Not all stars have names, only a few hundred of the brighter ones, and it's nice to learn some of them. In fact, many of our star names are Arabic in origin, dating back about a thousand years or so. We start here with Dubhay, then Merak, Fad, Migrez, Alioth, Mizar, and Alcaid. Migrez, where the handle joins the bowl, is fainter than the other six. If you look very carefully, you can see that Mizar is a double star. Its faint companion is called Alcor. The Great Bear actually contains a lot more stars than just those seven main ones. The head of the bear is over here. Her front paws, her back paws and back legs. So the Great Bear actually covers quite a large area of the sky, with the bowl of the plough being the rear of the Great Bear's body and the handle of the plough being the bear's tail. Now in mythology, the Great Bear goes back to the time of the ancient Greeks. 48 of our constellations were named by the Greeks and appeared in a publication called the Almagest, produced by the great astronomer Claudius Ptolemaeus, or Ptolemy for short, in about 150 AD. The Great Bear is one of those 48 original constellations. The mythology surrounding the Great Bear also goes back to the Greeks. It was said there was a beautiful young woman called Callisto who was an assistant to the goddess Juno. But Juno was very jealous of Callisto's beauty and, knowing that her husband Jupiter, the king of the gods, had a bit of a roving eye, she changed Callisto into a great bear. Some years later, Callisto's son Arcus saw the great bear while he was out hunting in the forest, not realising it was his mother. Jupiter, realising the disaster that was about to unfold, quickly changed Arcus into a little bear, and both the great bear and the little bear were placed in the sky. Now you can find the pattern of the little bear, or little dipper as it's sometimes called, by using the stars of the plough as a signpost. So here we have our saucepan shape. The two stars at the top of the bowl, Merak and Dupe, are often called the pointers because if you take a line from those two, we come to this star here. It's a very famous star, the North Pole star Polaris, and it marks the end of the little bear's tail. You can see the faint line of stars here and the box shape at the bottom. That's the little bear. Now I have an outline for the little bear, so let's see what that's like. You can see that the little bear here has a long bushy tail. It looks a bit like a squirrel to me, but the question is, why do the two bears have such long bushy tails? Everyone knows that bears have much shorter tails. Well, for the answer, we have to go back to the Greek legend. When Jupiter changed Callisto's son Arcus into a little bear, and the two bears raced off together through the forest, Jupiter decided to place them both up in the sky. So he grabbed them both by the tails and swung them up into the sky so violently that he stretched their tails to three times their original length. So that's why the two bears have much longer tails than expected. Polaris, the North Pole star, is not a particularly bright star. Some people think it's one of the brightest in the sky, but it isn't. However, it is a very important star because it's the nearest naked eye star to the north pole of the sky, marked here by the tip of that white arrow. Now you can see that Polaris is not precisely at the north pole of the sky. It's about half a degree away. In fact, the north pole of the sky, 
the tip of the white arrow, is on the plough side of Polaris. Now the north pole of the sky moves very slowly against the background stars. This is because as the Earth spins on its axis, it's wobbling like a spinning top in a child's nursery. Actually, as Earth's axis of rotation wobbles, or precesses as we call it, it makes a huge circle in the sky. The tip of the white arrow may lie close to Polaris now, but it hasn't always been there and won't always be so. It takes the north pole of the sky nearly 26,000 years to make that huge circle in the night sky shifting against the background stars. If we go back to when the pyramids were built nearly 5,000 years ago, that faint star there called Thuban in the constellation of the dragon was the North Pole Star. So over the past 5,000 years or so, the white arrow has gone from here all the way round to where it is today by Polaris and it will keep on moving. The North Celestial Pole will be closest to Polaris in about the year 2100 and then over thousands of years it'll slowly move on into the neighbouring constellation of Cepheus the King. The constellation of the Dragon is a long and winding line of stars, so let me trace it out. The head of the Dragon, here, is a quadrilateral of stars. And then we have the Dragon's neck and shoulders, its back and its long tail. The Dragon's tail is this line of faint stars in between the plough and the little bear. You can imagine it breathing fire from its mouth, just like this. In Greek mythology, Draco the dragon is sometimes identified with Ladon, the dragon that guarded the golden apples in the Garden of the Hesperides. The great bear, Ursa Major in Latin, the little bear, Ursa Minor, and Draco are all original constellations from the 48 listed by Ptolemy. Now if we go from the pointers in the plough and on through the pole star to the other side, we come to another very well-known pattern of stars. It's shaped like a letter M that's been sat on, or a letter W depending on which way you look at it. It is Cassiopeia, another of Ptolemy's original patterns. Cassiopeia was a proud and boastful queen and is a very distinctive pattern, high up in the northwest at this time of the year in the early evening. You should have no trouble finding it on the opposite side of the pole to the plough. Cassiopeia is one member of our celestial royal family. We have Queen Cassiopeia and then we have her husband King Cepheus. I mentioned Cepheus earlier because its brightest star, Alderamin, will be the pole star in about 6,000 years from now. Cepheus is a rather difficult pattern to make out. It comprises a faint box of stars with a triangle on the top. I always think it looks a bit like a house with a high pointy roof. You might say, well, I can't really see the shape of a king in that, but actually this is supposed to be the throne on which the king is sitting. Cepheus is certainly nowhere near as obvious as his wife the Queen, but may be found below and to the right of Cassiopeia as we look at it here. Then we have their beautiful daughter, the Princess Andromeda. This star, Alpha Rats, marks her head, and then we have this very long, narrow, curving V-shape of stars, which is the pattern of Andromeda, with her head, her arms, her waist and her legs. Here you can see the outline of the beautiful Andromeda. I'm afraid that I don't have outlines for all the constellations, just one or two of them. So there we have Andromeda, the beautiful daughter of the king and queen, making up our celestial royal family. You will notice just here, to the right of Andromeda's waist, that little elongated smudge of light in the sky. That is the Andromeda galaxy, the furthest thing you can see with the unaided human eye on a really clear, dark night. We live in a galaxy, the Milky Way, and its stars are all around us. 
Andromeda is the nearest large galaxy to our own Milky Way. It's about two and a half million light years away. Astronomers use the term light year as a measure of distance, not of time. A light year is the distance that a beam of light will travel in one year. Six million million miles, or just under 10 million million kilometres. So in round figures, the Andromeda galaxy is 15 million 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 miles away. That's 15 followed by 18 zeros. It's a great star system, a spiral galaxy containing billions of stars just like our own Milky Way. Of the remaining constellations we have in the north, down here we have the top of Cygnus the Swan. At this time of year, in the early evening, we can only see the wings and the tail of the swan. Most of the neck and the beak are below the horizon. Nearly all of the patterns that I've described, the plough, which is part of the Great Bear, the Little Bear, Draco, Cassiopeia and Cepheus are what we call circumpolar. In other words, as the Earth spins on its axis, those constellations revolve around the North Pole of the sky and they are always above the horizon. From this country, they never set, so we say they are circumpolar. So I think you can see how, beginning with the Plough or Big Dipper, which I think most people can find, we can extend our search for other star patterns and constellations using this principle of using one constellation to find another, a bit like touring a city, finding a few landmarks and using those landmarks to find your way from one place to another. We are looking here at the northern sky in winter as it would appear at seven o'clock in the evening but the Earth is spinning on its axis and this causes our view of the sky to change gradually during the course of the evening. Over time, the northern stars and constellation patterns appear to be revolving slowly around the north pole of the sky. Polaris, so close to the pole, hardly moves at all, but the plough will rise higher up in the northeast, while Cassiopeia will sink lower down in the northwest. When learning one's way around the night sky, it is important to understand how the stars appear to move over time. Well, we're now going to turn our attention to the southern part of the sky. Now we've turned to face towards the south at seven o'clock in the evening. Once again, we're going to start by looking at the view from the middle of a small town or perhaps an urban fringe area. So we've got some light pollution, reducing the total number of stars we can see, but even from such a place, the southern sky at this time of year is magnificent. The winter stars are a terrific sight, even from a light polluted location. And because we have some easy to find star patterns, it's not too difficult to find our way around. First and foremost, we have Orion the Hunter, and Sirius, the dog star, the brightest star in the night sky. And then all of the well-known star patterns around Orion. Many of their stars are quite bright, so they can be seen even in a light polluted sky. We also have the red planet Mars visible at the moment, which is always good to see. We have got no moon in the sky at present. That's because today is only one day after new moon. So even though we're looking at the sky for 7pm, the moon is not to be seen. However, the moon will become visible over the next few days and will become more and more obvious during the coming fortnight. Orion has many fairly bright stars and is a great signpost to help us find our way around. Here's Orion the Hunter with its four main stars and the three stars of Orion's belt that point down to Sirius the dog star. All around Orion there are more bright stars, so we'll start with Sirius, the brightest star in the big dog, Canis Major. Then we've got Procyon, brightest star in the little dog, Canis Minor. The twins of Gemini, Castor and Pollux. Capella in Auriga the charioteer, virtually overhead. 
then down to Aldebaran, one of the eyes of Taurus the bull, and on to Rigel, the bottom right star of Orion as we see it, and back to Sirius again. Those bright stars make up an asterism called the Winter Hexagon, and it includes all of the most obvious stars in the area around Orion. But now we're going to imagine that we are transporting ourselves from an urban fringe location to a nice dark countryside site. What a magnificent view we have now. To link this view of the southern sky with what we talked about earlier, I just want to draw your attention again to Cassiopeia the Queen, appearing here more like a letter W and high up in the western sky. We saw her when we were looking north and now we're also seeing her at the edge of our view. We've also got the Andromeda galaxy there that we mentioned earlier just below Cassiopeia. Moving to the left of Cassiopeia, you can see there's a long line of stars here and another there, which together look like the shape of an upside down letter Y. This is the constellation of Perseus, the great warrior and hero of Greek legend who was involved in many adventures. On one, he went off to deal with a fearsome creature called Medusa the Gorgon, who had live snakes for hair and could turn men to stone with just one look. Perseus looked at her reflection in his shield, which he had polished like a mirror, and beheaded her while she slept. As her head fell on the ground from the blood that was spilled was born Pegasus, the flying horse. Pegasus is a constellation you can see really well in the autumn sky, but is very low down in the west at this time of the year. Perseus is also involved in the legends surrounding Cassiopeia the Queen, her husband King Cepheus and their beautiful daughter Andromeda. Cassiopeia was very proud of her daughter and she boasted that Andromeda was more beautiful than any of King Neptune's sea nymphs, the Nereids. Well, Neptune flew into a terrible rage and sent a great sea monster to ravage the shores of their kingdom. After consulting an oracle, the king and queen realised there was only one thing they could do. Poor Andromeda would have to be sacrificed to be eaten by the sea monster. So she was chained to a rock, awaiting her fate. But in the nick of time, along comes Perseus, our hero, rescues the beautiful Andromeda from the sea monster, and they all live happily ever after, as they always do in these stories. In between the small triangle of stars at the top of Perseus and the W of Cassiopeia, you may just notice a faint misty patch. With good eyesight, you'll see two misty patches very close together. That is a beautiful pair of open star clusters, the double cluster in Perseus, also known as the sword handle. It is a fine sight in a low power rich field telescope. If we follow the line of stars in Perseus downwards, we eventually come to one of the most magnificent of all open star clusters, the Pleiades or Seven Sisters. We say the Seven Sisters because most people can make out seven stars on a clear dark night with the naked eye. With binoculars or a small telescope, you will see many more. They are all blue-white in colour. Now the Seven Sisters are part of the constellation of Taurus the Bull. The head of the bull is this V-shaped cluster of stars known as the Hyades with the red star Aldebaran marking one of the bull's eyes. The Hyades is an older and more scattered cluster than the Pleiades. Then we've got the horns of the bull, one of which goes out here and the other goes out here. The stars at the end of the horns are Beta Tauri there and Zeta Tauri there. If we add in the outline of Taurus the Bull, you can see it is a magnificent pattern. But you might be wondering, why is it only half a bull? What happened to the back end, you may ask? Well, as usual, the Greeks have got an answer. 
In their legend, the bull is swimming in the sea, and the back half of the bull is below the waves, which is why you can't see it. Only his head, shoulders and front legs are above the waterline. The story goes that Jupiter, king of the gods, had his eye on a beautiful young woman called Europa, and he wanted to abduct her. So he basically changed himself into a large bull, put Europa on his back, and then swam out into the sea. I mentioned earlier the bright star Capella, which is virtually overhead in the early evening at this time of year. It's a yellowish star, the sixth brightest star in the night sky. Capella is part of the constellation of Auriga the Charioteer. It's a sort of five-sided box shape like this. You can see it doesn't really look much like a man driving a chariot, or indeed a man looking after a herd of goats, which is what some of the legends say. In some depictions of Auriga, he's got a young goat under one arm and he's holding the reins of a chariot in the other arm, so he's probably part-time goat herd and part-time chariot driver. Below Capella, there are three stars in a tiny triangle. They are known as the Heidi or Kids and may represent the face of a young goat peering out from underneath the chariot driver's left arm. Interestingly, Auriga's bottom left star, which really does seem to be part of the overall shape, has been transferred to the neighbouring constellation of Taurus the Bull. So now, Beta Tauri, which is the end star of the upper horn of the bull, is officially no longer part of Auriga, although in some ways it makes more sense to be part of that pattern. Then we come down to Orion the Hunter. This magnificent grouping contains four stars in a sort of a rectangle shape, with the three stars of Orion's belt diagonally across the middle. Here we see the outline of Orion superimposed on the main stars. All of those main stars have names. Betelgeuse, top left, Bellatrix, top right, Rigel, lower right, and Safe, lower left. The three stars of Orion's belt are in order, Mintaka, Al-Nilam, and Al-Natak. The sword of Orion curves down below the belt, and near the tip of the sword, just there, you can see a faint misty patch. That is the Orion Nebula, a stellar nursery, a glowing cloud of gas and dust inside which new stars and new planets are being born right now. Orion is one of the few star patterns that really does look like the character it is supposed to be. Above the stars marking his shoulders, his head is here, and in his right arm he is holding a wooden club, and over his left arm is draped the skin of an animal that he's killed. The three stars of the belt point down to Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky, a beautiful blue-white star. You generally won't see it shining with a steady brightness as it appears here, because usually when you look at it, Sirius is flashing lots of different colours because the star is twinkling. That's nothing to do with the star itself. It's to do with the movement of warmer and cooler pockets of air in Earth's atmosphere through which the star's light is passing, a phenomenon called scintillation. The more the movement, then the more the stars will twinkle. But because Sirius is a bright star fairly low down in the sky, it normally twinkles quite a lot. Orion was a great hunter and there are many stories about him. One legend says that he boasted he could kill any creature on Earth which upset the goddess Juno, who was jealous of him. She caused a giant scorpion to appear out the ground, which stung Orion on his foot and killed him. Both Orion and the scorpion were subsequently placed in the sky, but on exactly opposite sides of the sky, so they would be forever chasing each other around, but never able to catch each other. When we were looking at the northern sky, we used the plough as a signpost to help us find other star patterns. Now we're looking at the southern sky, the stars of Orion can be used in the same way. The three stars in Orion's belt point down to Sirius the dog star in the constellation of Canis Major, the big dog, which is always rather low down from this country. If you take the three stars of Orion's belt and go the other way, you come to Aldebaran, 
one of the eyes of Taurus the bull and the V-shaped Hyades cluster. Extend that line onwards and you come to the Seven Sisters. Then if you take the right-hand star in the belt and go up through Betelgeuse, you come to Gemini the Twins with its two bright stars, Castor and Pollux. Pollux is definitely the brighter of the two. You can imagine the two heavenly twins lying side by side, a bit like two matchstick men. Head, body, feet and arms for the upper twin Castor, head, body, feet and arms for Pollux. The bright star here, which is sort of in between Gemini and Sirius, is Procyon in Canis Minor, the little dog. This rather barren area in between the little dog, the big dog and Orion, containing only a few stars, is the constellation of Monoceros the unicorn. There are many parts of the sky with only faint stars and no obvious pattern. Monoceros is one of these. If you look directly overhead at this time of year, just above Capella, there's a large, really barren area of sky containing the constellations of Camelopardalis the giraffe and Lynx the lynx. It extends all the way from Perseus above Auriga and eastwards towards Ursa Major, the great bear. One of the things we haven't really talked about much is the distances of stars. Although the stars we see are all at different distances from us, it appears to us as though they're on the inside of a giant sphere, the celestial sphere, with us at the centre. But that is just an illusion. We measure the distances to stars in terms of how many light years they are away from us. This is also how long it takes for their light to travel from them to us. Some stars are relatively nearby and some are much further away. We have two fairly nearby stars to our sun visible in the southern sky here. Sirius, the dog star, is only just over eight and a half light years away. In other words, its light is taking just over eight and a half years to reach us. Procyon here in the little dog is 11 and a half light years distant, so those two stars are relatively nearby. Remember that each light year is six million million miles or just under 10 million million kilometres. The principal stars in Gemini are a little further away, Pollux at 34 light years and Castor at 52 light years. If we look up at the yellowish Capella, it's 42 light years away. Turning to Taurus the Bull, Aldebaran, the reddish star which looks like it's part of the V-shaped Hyades cluster, is actually only about half as far away. Aldebaran lying at 65 light years, the Hyades at about 145 light years. The stars of the Pleiades or Seven Sisters are just over 400 light years away. So when you look at the cluster in binoculars or a low power telescope, the light you're seeing has taken just over 400 years to travel from those stars into our eyes. Now about four centuries ago, the Italian astronomer Galileo Galilei and the Elizabethan astronomer Thomas Harriot were both looking at the sky with the first telescopes. So you can imagine, when you look up at the Seven Sisters tonight, that the light entering your eyes left those stars when Galileo and Harriot were first looking up at the heavens all those years ago. Of the main stars in Orion, Bellatrix is the nearest, at about 245 light years, but all of the others are much more distant. The distances of Betelgeuse and Rigel are somewhat uncertain, but Betelgeuse is probably the nearer of the two, at about 640 light years, while Rigel is about 800 light years distant. The distances of the other main stars in Orion are between 720 and 1300 light years, and the Orion Nebula is also about 1300 light years away. Betelgeuse and Rigel, at opposite corners of the main pattern of Orion, have very contrasting colours. Betelgeuse is orangey-red, while Rigel is blue-white. 
Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star, a star so huge that if it was dropped into the middle of our solar system, its outer layers would stretch out to the orbit of the planet Jupiter. It's a star in late middle age that has expanded to enormous size, and giant stars like that pulsate. Betelgeuse pulsates slowly over several years in various periods, and as it pulsates, its brightness varies. Sometimes it can appear as bright as Procyon in The Little Dog, while at other times it fades to the brightness of Aldebaran in Taurus the Bull. So it's worth checking on the brightness of Betelgeuse because it does vary over time. Rigel, a blue-white supergiant star, is the brightest of Orion's stars, ranked seventh brightest in the night sky. If you look at the Orion Nebula through a telescope, it appears as a faint, misty patch. Images of it will show lots of colour, mainly red, but if you look at it with the naked eye through a telescope, it will just look greyish, because our eyes don't see colour when the light level is low. On a really clear, dark night, the view of the Orion Nebula through a large telescope is a magnificent sight. You can see wisps and filaments of gas, and you really get the idea that this is a stellar nursery, a starbirth region. Right at the heart of the Orion Nebula are four very luminous stars called the trapezium stars. These are very massive, very hot white stars, the radiation from which is lighting up the centre of the Orion Nebula. To the west of Orion, there is a large, fairly barren area of sky with few stars, extending down to the southern horizon here. That is the constellation of Eridanus the River, a long, straggly line of stars that meanders its way from near Rigel right the way down into the southern hemisphere. At the southern end of Eridanus the River is the bright star Achenar, but you can't see that from southern England. The red planet Mars is on the border of Aries and Taurus, moving slowly eastwards. Over a period of a week or so, you'll notice that motion. Mars was at its best last year in the autumn, and it's faded considerably since then as its distance from the Earth has increased, but it's still worth a look. Its orangey-red colour will be quite obvious in binoculars or a small telescope, but don't expect to see much by way of detail on the tiny disk. Three new space probes are due to arrive at Mars this month. In particular, Mars is going to be explored in great detail by a six-wheeled roving vehicle called Perseverance that's scheduled to land in a very exciting region of Mars on the 18th of February. This view of the southern sky is what you'll see at 7 o'clock in the evening. As the Earth spins on its axis from west to east, carrying you, the observer, around with it, the stars slowly appear to move in the opposite direction, from east to west. Here in the planetarium, we can speed up time. So now you can see how our view gradually changes as we move through the evening from 7pm to 10pm. Over a period of three hours, the constellations move round quite a bit. So if you are learning your way around the night sky, it is important to understand how what you see slowly changes as time passes. Our journey through the winter night sky has now come to an end. I hope you enjoyed the show. More importantly, I hope you've been inspired to learn more about the night sky and the amazing wonders of the universe in which we live. Good night.